did a really good baby impression. <sighs> well, I hope you all had an amazing uh, 4th of July weekend. It was an amazing opportunity. We got to worship together uh, last week and see God do some incredible things. Um, today is it's just another opportunity for us to continue on in this, in this message of the lifestyle that God has called us to live and to, to be in and walk in. And, and it's encouraging for, for parents and for grandparents and, and uh, for those of you looking to be involved in family. And um, it's just an amazing opportunity for us to understand uh, what God thinks about family and how he portrays himself as family in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing to me that, that God, you know, when he, when he created everything, he looked at everything, he said, man, that's good, that's good, that's good, until he got to man, and then he was like, that's not good. <laughs> that's not the place where you women are supposed to say amen. <laughs> he said, it's, it's good, but it's just not complete. How many of you men are thankful that he said that's not complete? There you go. And so he created the structure of family and that we can walk in and that he represents with, with who he is. And he does nothing without purpose. He doesn't do anything without purpose. We don't bring babies up here with no purpose. We, we're purposing in our hearts. To be a part of this child's life. We are purposing in our hearts to pray. Why? Because we are called to be a reflection of who God is. And everything God does is done with purpose. Now oftentimes in life it's easy to question purpose. It's easy to say, God, that does not make any sense to me. What are you thinking? God, why am I walking through this situation? God, I didn't, this was not my fault. This is... This is something completely out of my control, but I'm walking through this situation. God, what is the purpose behind this? I was praying one of these prayers this week, and I'll get to that in a minute. But there's often times, and I preached it last week, when God just, just not, it does not make sense. Is it super echoey in here today? <laughs> cool. I just want to yell. No, nah, I won't. Have any, have any of you just, I'll know if I don't need to preach today, have any of you ever walked through one of these seasons where you just said, this does not make sense? Raise your hand. How many of you have never walked through one of those seasons? You can come hang out in my house for a while. There are seasons in everyone's life when things just don't make sense. But it's those very times and those very seasons that we walk through and how we respond in those situations and how we control ourselves in those situations that directly affect whether we learn or whether we're crushed by the circumstances around us. And since we're talking about when God doesn't make sense, let's start with, I'm going to start the same way I started last week, but go a little different route. With a word that I think most of us think we understand, but we don't. And I talked about it last week, and it's the word comfort. Everyone say comfort. Andrea, I, I know I'm throwing you a curveball. Did you keep that slide from last week? No, oh, it's already up there. You are good. Everyone, I need you to turn around, look up behind that computer that that girl is hiding behind, and say, way to go. <laughs> now you too can be up there behind that computer. If only you would say yes. I'm just kidding. The history of the word comfort reveals the evolving way we see God's footprint in the plan that we call life. The footprint that we walk through in pain and, 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 and all these other things in life through circumstances and struggles. The word is made from two Latin words, two Latin parts meaning come, together with, and fortis meaning strong or strength. Now, I talked about this last week. We... When we think of the word comfort, we've, we've transformed this word, and it's transformed through, through, through time and, and, and through language and through translation. Uh, we, when we read the word comfort, we think, what do you think of? I told you last 
next to me. I think of the corner spot on my couch where it has a long leg and I can put my legs up and I grab three pillows and I'm hugging the pillows and with a blanket and my remote. That's my comfort. And you're like, so ungodly of a pastor to watch TV and sit on his couch. Yeah, probably. But we think of amenities, or, we, or maybe you think of, of like your favorite sweats, or, or just being, you know, relaxed, and ah, how many of you have your comfort space? If not, don't come to my house, <laughs> go find it somewhere else. But in about a millennia, from, from when the Bible was written until it was, and when it was translated to the time we live in today, this word that we see so often in the gospel, it, went, it changed from a word that means together, strength, to something that we think of today as like a pain barrier. Like, stay away from me, everything that's bad. I'm putting up a wall, and this wall is called comfort. No one can touch me inside my bubble. But when we understand what the Bible says in the context in which it's said, it doesn't say that, that, that his comfort is this thing that keeps all pain away from you. It says that it is something that when he brings his comfort, it means he is coming with us in strength to walk with us. Oftentimes we want comfort in our lives that we mean want all, we want all the struggles, the pain, and all the junk just to go away. But how many of you know God doesn't always do that? Sometimes you walk through things and sometimes you walk through life and there are struggles and there are circumstances and there are pain and you're asking God why. And he's saying, listen, it doesn't matter the why. The mat- what matters is you're walking with me and I've already attained the victory for you to walk in. You see, he comes to give us com- to comfort. When something terrible happens, we don't see God intervene. We sometimes wonder whether he's really there at all. But the title of my message today and and what I want to tell you and what I want to encourage you with is something that we say all the time, but you need to understand it. You are never alone. You never walk alone. You never fall alone. You never struggle alone. You are never alone. We don't see God intervene at times. We don't know whether he's really there at all, but we're not alone. Before comfort, before the word comfort we're morphed into this thing that we, we feel is a barrier for pain, King David experienced a time when, he's, when God seemed inattentive to him. He seemed distant to him. And he wrote a letter and he said, God, how long will you forsake me? That's how this letter started in Psalms chapter 13. He said, how long will you forsake me? said, this is all the stuff I'm going through. These are all the struggles. These are all the pains. This is how how bad it is. And then he kind of, something opened up in his mind. He said, but I will give glory and honor to the Lord my God who has never left me nor forsaken me. See, the key to your walk with God isn't being perfect. It's not how much you read. It's not how much you worship. It's not how nice you are. It's not how much you give the honor. The key to your life and to being able to, to, to keep pressing on and moving forward in the destiny and the, and the plans that God has for you is no, no greater thing than to receive comfort, which means being together with Him. Be with Him. You say, well, I'm walking through this. I'm walking through struggles. I'm walking through divorce. I'm walking through, through my kids are, are gone. My, my, they're not loving Jesus. They're, they're doing this. They're doing that. Walk with Jesus. Oftentimes, I know us men especially, we like to fix things. My wife, my wife would like me to fix more things around the house. Sometimes fixing things is not a solution. The solution is, God, who are you and where are you in this situation? That's what I want to know. How can I walk together with you? How can I be who you've called me to be? You see... I'll tell you a story. There was an old man, and many of you, some of you may have heard this story before. It's just a great analogy. Uh, An older man driving his truck down the road. He and his wife bought this truck new, and it was, you know, I don't know if any of you remember uh, bench seats. They don't make them anymore. And this truck, it was a single cab truck, and there was a bench seat 
And these, these, this young married couple went and bought this, this truck, and she would always sit right next to him. They would cuddle up, and they would drive down the road together, and everything was great. And 20 years later, they're still driving the same truck. That's how you know this guy was smart, because he bought a Chevy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He could have been driving a Ford. That's what I tried. Just kidding. (laughs) Don't make that your theology, please. That's nothing biblical about what I just said. His wife turned to him, looked at him, driving down the road, and she said, "What happened to us? What happened? We used to be together. We used to." You know, we used to call, used to hold my hand, used to talk to me, used to sing to me, used to do all these things. And the wise old man looked at his wife and said, who moved? Bam. <laughs> looked at his wife and said, well, I, I'm, I'm right here. I didn't move. And oftentimes we walk through life. We walk through struggles and pains, and we often shake our fists in heaven and say, God, how could you? Where were you? Why did you do this? And he's just saying, listen, I didn't move. I'm seated on my throne. I walk in power. I've, I've released authority to you, and I didn't move. Intimacy was lost. I didn't move. You see, God does a really good job of maintaining his portion. Per, portion his side of our relationship with him. Let me say that again because I messed it all up. God does a really good job of maintaining his responsibility within our relationship. He's given us promises. He's given us direction. He's given us vision. And he stands by what he says. He doesn't move. He doesn't leave us. He does not forsake us. And there's only one There's only one other factor in this relationship, and that's you. Have you moved? Have you slid over a little bit? Have you walked away? From intimacy? Have you walked away from his promises? Have you walked away from his goodness and his love? You know, one of the verses that I I quote all the time, but today I'm actually going to go there, prove to you that it's in the Bible and I don't just say it. It's found in John chapter 16. It says, these things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think they offer God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you them. And these things I do not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judge. I still have many things to say to you. You cannot hear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Stay with me for just a little bit longer. Skip to verse 31, if you would. 
That's how Jesus started this talk with his disciples. He said, you're not going to understand all this. You're not going to figure it out, but just trust that I have everything in order and that I'm doing everything I do. In verse 31, Jesus answered them and said, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and it will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I don't know what you're walking through, what you're struggling with, but I believe that Jesus is a really good example of how we should relate to circumstances and struggles. Because he went through more than any of us will ever go through, I hope. When he was abandoned by his friends and when he was hung upon a cross, he said, I'm going to be okay. All of you are going to leave me, and I know you're going to leave me. But he said, I'm going to be okay. Why? Because he says, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this life you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus understood this. That he never walked alone. His friends abandoned him. His family abandoned him. Everyone was gone. The Father in heaven, in the very end, turned his head. He understood that he was alone. Yet he walked in comfort. Why? Because together, there's strength. I could go on. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20. In the New Testament, when the disciples and, and, and those that were walked with Jesus and were, were sent out to be the, the testimony of, of all that Jesus did and was to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth in Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Acts chapter 8, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city, and he continued, there are a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. You know, we say it all the time, God is with you, God is with you, God is with you. You realize that he paid such a high price to be with you. He paid such a high price that you would never have to walk alone, to feel alone, to be alone. He put us in this, in this amazing, amazing structure called church that produced family and people who had no family, that produced life and people that had no life so people would never have to walk alone by themselves, struggling, moving from there, here to there. When we bring babies up for this dedication today, when we, when we did that, it wasn't, just, it wasn't just something cute that we do or something that, you know, we want to bless the family and bless them and, and show off how cute our kids are. It's a commitment that we make that Jesus himself made, saying, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. But there's life and there's strength in being together. There's comfort in together. If the Holy Spirit is called our comforter, and he is our access to being together with a good and loving Father, who will never leave you, never forsake you. My question is, in your time of struggle, who moved? In your time of doubt, who moved? In your fear, who moved? It's time for people to rise up and take personal responsibility for their relationship with God. Because when people take personal responsibility for their relationship with God and they walk together in intimacy, then a world is transformed and changed. Look at Acts. It's just a group of misfit men who chose to walk with Jesus. They weren't the smartest. They weren't the most handsome. They weren't the best behaved at times. But they chose to walk with Jesus. I 
the fact is we're never alone. When all seems lost, you're not alone. When you're broken and you're hurt, you're not alone. When you feel the sting of loss and pain, you're not alone. When you can't seem to find the way, you're not alone. When it seems like the whole world is with you, you're not alone. Unless you chose it. Unless you chose it. I was praying this week from a place of of hurt and pain in my own life. A place of frustration and I ask God, you say you make all things work together for the good of those who love you and all uh, love you and are called according to your purposes. And I ask God this question, God, how can this be good? I believe in your word. I believe what you say. I do not see how this situation, this circumstance that we're walking through right now can be good. I just don't. This is not the Bible. This is what in my own personal walk, in my prayer time, God spoke to me. I recorded it and wrote, kind of, I wrote, it, wrote it down later and then put it into my, my sermon notes today. But he said to me this. He said, I am all that is good. In me is everything you will ever need, and through my son you have access to all of me. But I will not force anything on you, even my goodness. It is your responsibility to learn how to receive my goodness. And because God knows that I'm a little dense sometimes and I can't figure anything out on my own, he painted me a picture. He said, it's like a a child learning to ride a bike. I'm not going to ride that bike for them or suddenly go against the physical laws of earth to make sure they don't fall. I could, but that would never bring either of us joy. See, I don't want to do it for you. I want you to discover your strength and be confident in the abilities I've placed inside of you. I've made the way so that you can walk in it, but you have to walk. We have to do it together. Do you feel alone today? Do you feel broken? Do you feel hurt? Do you feel distant from God? He didn't move. You have an opportunity and a choice today to step in to all that he's called for you. Step into his goodness, whether you see it or not. You have, a, you have the ability today to choose the goodness of God. Why? Because he paid such a high price for it that he's not willing to withhold it from you. you. Say, well, I need to earn it. I need to get right first. I need to do this. No, you don't. You need to put your hands out and say, God, I receive it. And then you need to walk in it. Well, God's not blessing me. God's not doing this. God's not doing this. Well, how hard are you working for it? Because he's not going to step in and do everything for you. He's willing to work alongside of you. He's willing to open doors. He's willing to light your path. But the path is still there for you to walk. I want, you, I want to show you this video for a moment that just speaks of what I'm talking about today. And as they do, I'm going to ask Javier just to come. And, and I just want to take the last five to ten minutes of this service and just give you an opportunity to respond. And think about this question. Did I, have I moved? Have I scooted over in the seat? Have I moved away from intimacy with God? in this season of my life? Have struggles or circumstances or situations pressed me to a place where I have moved away from the only one who has the answer for my life, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ? Ask yourself that question. Will you do me a favor and will you just start it over? If there are over 7 billion people on earth, then why do I feel so alone? If there is someone for everyone, then why does it feel like it's just me? If I have friends, then how come I can end up feeling so friendless? If I have family, then why do I sometimes feel like a family of one? These are some of the questions that I've had to ask myself at times, but I have never seemed to get an answer until I look into the Word of God. The truth is, if you know Jesus, 
You are not alone. You are not alone. No matter how many times you have walked by yourself, God says that he will be with you wherever you go. No matter how many times you have fallen and had to pick yourself up, Jesus says that he knows you and that he laid down his life for you. You are not alone. No matter how hard things have gotten, the Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. You are not alone. No matter how long you've been waiting, Jesus says that he is coming back and until then he has sent his Holy Spirit to live in you. You are not alone. No matter what your situation has turned into, Jesus promises that you can find rest in him. You are not alone. No matter who has deserted you, Jesus says that he will be with you always. You are not alone. But the Bible does show us what loneliness is like. Utter loneliness is what Jesus experienced as he hung on the cross. Loneliness, sin, death, and separation are what he overcame so that we could be with God so that when we repent and turn to him, we can rest in his presence so that we can experience his friendship forever. Today, I want to challenge you. Today, I want to challenge you with this. There's three kinds of people in this place today. First, the first person is you're in this place and never even gotten in the truck with Jesus. You've never even said, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm out here wandering around. You've never joined with him in relationship and saying, hey, I want to do this journey of life with you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I give you all that I am and all my life. And you've never even, you've never even gotten in the car with him. The second group of people is you've been in the car. Maybe you've been in the car for years with God, but you slid over in that seat and you've become distant. There's times when you look at him and you just say, hey, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing. What, what, what happened? And he's saying, there's room. Come closer. There's, you just slide over here. There's rest and peace and comfort in who I am. And then there's those of you in this place who you are just, you're there right next to him already. And you're just loving life and enjoying the journey. And he's showing you new things and he's, and he's taking you new places. He's pointing things out along the way and it's been an incredible journey. But if you're here today and you, you're in one of those first two places, you're saying, man, I gotta, I gotta do something different. I got to make a change. There has to be more than this. There has to be more than what I'm experiencing and what I've been walking. There is. There is comfort. There is the ability to walk together with he who is strength. Would with me all across this room. You would just close your eyes for a moment and just ask the Lord God, have I moved? If I slid over in that seat, God, have I have I gotten in the car with you? If you're not sure if you've gotten in the car, you need to get in the car. If you're not sure about your relationship with God or even if you have one, you need to start one. 
you, how could you tell me what I need? What I, need? I know what you need. Because you were created by him. You were created through him and for him to have a relationship with him. If you're in this place today, I'm going to ask you to do something really brave. If you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never opened that door and climbed in that car with Him and allowed Him to be Lord of your life and to lead you down this road of life and to take you on this journey, I want to pray with you today specifically. That you would allow the Lord to come into your life and to be your Lord and Savior. It's not just to achieve salvation, it's to live life here the way He's called you to live. If you're in this place today and you're saying, I need to give my life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you very simply just to raise your hand up very quickly. Saying, I'm, I've never even gotten in the car with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if you're in this place and you're saying, listen, I've, I'm in the car, I've been on this journey, and I, for some reason, I've slid to the other side of the cab. You're saying, man, I just want to move over. I want to get back to intimacy with God. I want to go after Him with all that I am, because I understand that my purpose and my destiny is found right next to Him. If you're in that place today, would you do something very simple? Would you just slip your hand up in the air very quickly? You're just declaring, yeah, I need to get back to it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Just so I know, if you're in this place and you're saying, man, I am walking with Jesus and I'm on this journey and it's fun. I'm not, you're not saying I'm perfect by raising your hand. You're just saying, listen, I think I'm doing the best I can. I, I'm walking with God. I'm, I'm going after him. If that's you in this place, just raise your hand for me real quick. Okay, so at some point you should have had your hand up to one of those three. If you didn't, what you're doing is you're saying, I refuse to make a choice today about what you're saying. I choose to stay the way that I am. And I'm not trying to condemn you or convict you in any way. That's not my job. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. So if you, rose your, if you raise your hand, if you're saying yes to any of those three, what I want you to do right now is just stand up. And if you said yes to one of the first two, I'm going to invite you. We're, going to sing, we're just going to sing one song. That's it. We're not going to take a lot of time with this. But if you said yes to one of the first two things that I asked about, what I want you to do is just come to the front of this place, and I just want you to worship for just a moment. Someone's going to come alongside of you. We're just going to pray with you. If you are one of the in the third group where you're saying, I'm walking with Jesus, I welcome you to come up to pray for one of these that are coming now. Just give them a second to come first. Give them a second to come. These are people that have either slid over in the seat or they're needing Jesus for the first time in their lives. Come on, don't be afraid. You can come up a little closer. Don't be afraid. We're not going to attack you. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. I'm going to sing this. We're going to sing this song just a few times. Someone's going to come alongside of you and pray for you. And they're going to ask you, listen, are you coming for salvation? Which means you need to get in the car with Jesus. Or do you want to slide over? They're going to ask you that question. If you're coming to minister, I want you to ask that question. Listen, you just need to be closer to Jesus, or is this your first time? And they're going to pray with you, and they're going to invite you. They're, they're going to come alongside of you, and together, you guys are going to walk through this short, just easy prayer. The power isn't in the prayer of the person. The power is in your decision when you walk away from this place. It's easy to make a decision up here. It's easy to make a decision when there's pretty music and lights. It's not as easy when you're out there in the world. But what starts here is, is planted and creates a foundation in your life to build upon anywhere you go. So 
Father God, in the name of Jesus, I would ask for courage and strength in these that have said yes. I'm